Hey, how's it going everyone? And welcome back to another episode of Billsy's Workbench Journal. Yes, I'm still burnout, and no, I'm not building anything. I'm still in the process of cleaning up my uh, workbench area. I'm still getting things in order. I did get my airbrush, my airbrushes cleaned up and set up and ready to go with good reason. Just in case I get back into things. However, I am going to have to get new tips for my old Badger 350 since I do a lot of single color projects, as you already know. Um, <clears throat> now, I may not be doing any builds or anything at the moment, but it doesn't stop me from talking about on the workbench drill, like what I got going on halfway through half built projects or things I actually have built last. Like last year, I was working on a P47 before I went on vacation. And unfortunately, my camera crapped out and I was talking about it. One I built of the uh, Tobias P47 kit, which I have right here. The P47 I built last year was, it was a nice change of pace. It really was. It was very pleasant for two reasons. One, it was a Tamiya kit. I mean, Tamiya makes some beautiful kits, of course, and their P47 is no exception. And two, it was different for me because even though it was, like I said, even though it's a World War II European subject, I don't do them very often. They're kind of rare for me, for a simple reason. Um, I shouldn't say simple reason, but for myriad reasons. For some of you guys who know me well enough or have seen my videos and stuff, I tend to lean, even though I'm, I do like World War II, I tend to lean more towards the Pacific theater, not the European theater. Like, I'm talking like the Japanese, a lot of U.S. Navy, U.S. Marine Corps subjects. Sometimes an Air Force subject that served in the uh, Pacific Theater, particularly the P-37 and the P-37. No, P-38 and the P-47. And so it was, it was just a nice change of pace to head back to Europe, to the European Theater for a bit. And also I had some bizarre incidents when I was building a lot of World War II German and Italian subjects. So I don't do them very often. However, let's get back to the can here. Anyway, so... This ended up, this is the uh, Tamiya kit, and the Tamiya kit's a really, really nice kit. It was very, it's very beautiful from beginning to end. It was an easy build, gave me the option of, you know, all the bells, webbles, webbles, <laughs> whistles. I could have dropped the flaps, put the flaps open on the cowling, opened the doors on the side. I chose not to do that, and I actually built that as an early P47D. I think a P47D block one through five. The basic, the basic D model. And <clears throat> so I had to remove a lot of things or leave off a lot of things since the Tamiya P47 kit has had a lot of options. We're talking like, you could build it all the way up to the Block 25, but as the Razorback version. And for some reason, the Razorback version of the P47, to me, that's symbolic of the P47. And as you can tell here, this is, this is the reason why they call it the Razorback, because of this. Is that here before they introduced the bubble top starting from late block 25 on. <laughs> and I really didn't, you know, it was, the P-47 itself was a beast during World War II. It wasn't the best fighter, but it was well built. It was rugged. It had a lot of firepower. It could carry a lot of bombs, rockets, you name it, it could, it could do it. It wasn't very fast unless it was in a dive. And the range... Wasn't that great, but to be fair, most aircraft didn't have the range during World War II, except for maybe the P-38 and the P-51. So, <clears throat> as time went on, they added more things to it, and much like the F-16, it, the P-47D, the base of that model was built in production blocks, so there was always an improvement or something. And these were mostly little, un until the, the bubble top came along, which was still known as the D. They just added little things, like they added improving the air conditioning, heating, um, they added other odds and ends, and they just, in production blocks, each block had it. And the one I built was actually a block, I think it was, a, it was block one through five. There's one of them, I don't remember which. Basically, it had, um, the flaps were modified, it were given a uh, cut over here, as you see. They, it was also given the bolt keel, which was actually retrofitted to the early block. P-47D, so I think that came around block five, and, you know, it just went from there. Otherwise, everything else was still the same on the P-47. <clears throat> anyway, so I'll talk about the, the P-47 I built, the subject. This one, like you said, was an early P-47. I didn't add any 
I didn't add a line to it because I'm just too lazy at the moment. <laughs> but the subject I built was actually known as Gigs Up, which was flown by uh, Lieutenant Gignac during World War II. And he was one of the first pilots that flew the early P-47, or the P-47 in general. And, you know, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't a glory hound, but he also wasn't one to shy away. You know, he did his job as a pilot, and that's what he did. And as you can see here... The details were actually from a um, super scale sheet that I picked up over the summer. But we'll talk about more on that later. First, I'll start talking about the B-47, the kit itself. Yeah, the Tamiya kit, like I said before, it's a beautiful kit. It's, it's would I consider it to be all end all of all P-47 kits? I don't know. You know, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. But until somebody else comes along with a new one, it is definitely one of the best kits available. And, you know, like I said, I did my research. I have a book from Detail and Scale of the P-47 in action, which is a great book. And I think Squadron also put out a book, a walk around on the P-47, which I really should pick up sometime. Um, back to the kit. Now, the P-47 itself was kind of unusual, not because of where it was built, not because of how it was built. It, it was the approach to everything. It was just a big, big bird. And what made it interesting with the P-47 was the cockpit itself. This is what caused me to do more research on the United States World War II aircraft in general. The cockpit itself was actually a, was more of an emerald green than it was a yellow green. And the main gear interior was actually a yellow. I'll show you here. If you can see very carefully, this is actually a, almost an emerald green in there. Good match I found was European green, which the federal standard was 34092. You can find that color anywhere from Testers has got it, Vallejo, Life Color, Enamels have it too. Humbrol's probably got an equivalent of it if you got the numbers for it. And I used that throughout the cockpit. The only variants of the P-47 that, had, that didn't have this color was the P-47G, which was built by Curtis. They had a color called Curtis Green, which was the equivalent of Green's in Chromate and the P-47N, but the P-47N was, cockpit was mostly black, and the floor, I think, was greens and chromate. This is, but the end was built specifically for the Pacific. I may end up building that version eventually. And the interior, although it was pretty common, was zinc chromate, which is actually more of a yellow, as you can see here. You know, like I said, I was in for a rude shock when I started getting into World War II. <laughs> and then I started building U.S. aircraft, and I did my research, and I was in a rude shock. I always thought green seat chromate was the norm, and it really wasn't. But you tell here, it's yellow. And the, they still used the, that color seat chromate throughout the entire war. Well, Republic Aviation did for the P-47. Whether it was in Farmingdale, which was the original factory, and they opened one up in Evansville, Illinois. Illinois? No, Indiana. I think it was Indiana. I'm not sure. I know it's Evansville. And, you know, it was a rude shock for me. So the more research I did, I found out everybody had different variations or specific requirements before everything started to become commonplace. So, and, you know, everything was... So it was kind of a rude shock, but I got everything taken care of. You know, I did the interior. I did the cockpit. And, but, yeah, as I said, the Tamai kit was a dream to build. Had no troubles. The cockpit actually was very well done. A um, few pointers I'm going to point out. The, this has the corrugated floorboard, so check your references accordingly, like particularly towards the um, bubble top version. The P-47 started having a smooth floorboard <clears throat> after a certain production block, so check your references. Uh, it went together well, did everything accordingly, did my dry brushing, did my detail painting. I, As you know, I did everything else. And as I said before, I built this, as you can see here, I built this as a buttoned up version. So the doors were closed, the side doors were closed. I put the flaps up. Another reason why I put the flaps up, most of the pictures I've seen of the P-47, all of them in general, the flaps were mostly up. The only time I've ever seen them down was actually on displays at the museums. And the actual aircraft, like combat photos, flaps were up. The engine was done accordingly. The engine is pretty much the same the one they use in the Corsair, the Hellcat, and I think a few others, if I'm not correct. If I'm not sure, I'm probably not correct. Let me, I stand, I, yeah, it's been a long day. <laughs> I'm tired. 
uh, of course, the usual. Did my neutral gray over the off neutral gray underside, off drop upper side. Cowling I did in white, and I used white decals for the tail and the horizontals. This is for identification of Allied aircraft during World War II. Now we're gonna move, and of course I did my paint. I used light color this time around for that one because I didn't have the equivalents from Vallejo or I didn't have them from testers. And I, testers, you, you might be able to find them in enamel, but in, but in, um, excuse me, but in, hold on, I lost my train of thought. But in acrylic, I'm not so sure. I know they, they had a couple of World War II colors for the ANA chart, which I'm not very familiar with. I'm still doing my research on that. So I went with the light color paints. I had to, I, that was the last time I used my, Badger 350 before I gave it a rest and started working with my double action again. So I did, you know, I did the same technique like I did with everything else. I used the fun tack for the demarcation line on this, as you can see here. Use the demar and I sprayed this first, gave this a couple days. The reason why I gave it a couple days is Life Color has a weird way of drying. And I probably talked about it before, but we'll revisit it again. When it dries, it actually fully dries. It actually dries lighter. The fit when it's fully dry, cured, it's lighter than it it is once dry, dry, like dry to the touch. And you can actually see it as you let it sit longer and longer. It's pretty interesting, but it takes a little while for it to dry. I mean, acrylics take longer to dry to begin with. But in Life Color's case, they're a little longer to dry. I guess it's the way the formula's set up. Uh, you know, using Life Color is a lot of trial and error. <laughs> I learned a lot the hard way. So I did my usual. I made sure I covered the cowling, though, to make sure I covered the cowling so I didn't get any spray on that. I actually used, uh, I used Tamaya White on this. Long, funky story. <laughs> so... Once I was done, took care of that. You know, I also did my interior. All the interiors were done with testers, correct, by the way. And the landing gear was actually sprayed with Tamiya aluminum. Took my time. You know, I did my research on gigs up. <clears throat> which, of course, I did my research. And the sheet I got was actually from Superscale. Now, I'm no stranger to Superscale decals. I've used them, you know, my, during my early days. They were nicely done. And they, for some reason... Superscale ceased back in the late 90s or somewhere around that time frame. So I was able to get a pile of pile of decal sheets for like discount. And then they were gone. You know, they had a, you had Airmaster, Eagle Strike, and other things. Well, they popped up again during the early mid 2000s. The in the sheet I got, which is four gigs up, is they also had um Virginian, which is also an early P47. D, and for some reason, it just, the decals weren't quite right. So, the only things I used on this were the main markings, like the lettering, the, these here. I did use some of the stencil, I also I used most of the stenciling from the Super Scale kit. Like, the white was opaque, the, everything else was fine. But when I used their stars and bars, as you can see here, these are the Tamaya ones, by the way. We'll discuss that some more. For some reason, it just, the stars and bars and the, even the white, I shouldn't say the white, the red on the super scale sheet just didn't seem right. Because a good quality, this is, well, I'll explain it. Good quality decals are usually silk screened or they're computer printed, depending on what kind of printer you have. But for some reason, they just didn't seem right. They seemed, you know, like the blue was off. You know, a fellow moderate set told me, you know, it's probably, it could be for scale effect, which is true to a degree. But once I applied them on, fortunately I was able to remove them before before I left them there. It just didn't seem right. Like you tell, it was off. Like the white was showing up through the stars and bars, so I skipped using those. I only used the um, I only used the important stuff. And so, except for the stenciling was the stenciling was all kit was all super scale. But everything else, like the stars and bars and the stripes, identification stripes. Actually, I think the identification stripes were also super scale, if I'm not correct. I don't, I gotta remember how I did things. But I used the Tamaya stars and bars here, as you can see. There, there, and of course, here, and here on the sides and on top of the wing. 
Like you said, I think I used the invasion stripes. I got to remember, I got to look at the sheet, whatever I got left. So those are what I used. The Tamiya kits, the Tamiya decals, they are thick. But if you have a good decal solvent, and if you use a microscale method, you may have to apply microsol a few times before they finally settle. But you could use Solvacet, pulls them right in without a hitch. But I did a, I did an inspection before I cleaned everything up. And you know, I used it in, used Solvacet a couple times in any spots that had a couple air bubbles, pop, put some more Solvacet, sucked it in, it was done. Gave it a day or two to fully cure, wiped everything down, I did my usual. I did my usual. I put on the, I put on the uh, flat coat. Now before I did any of those, I did put a gloss coat on after the life color. I gave the life color a few days to fully cure. I did apply a future gloss coat, and I did it in, in, um, yeah, okay. I did it in a couple of dust coats. The reason being is because the last time I heavily applied a. Um, Heavily applied future over life color. The life color was very thirsty and sucked all the gloss in. So I had to do that in like three, four coats. So what I did, I dusted two to three coats at the most this time on on that paint and over the paint job worked so much better. And it did just fine with the decals too. And like I said, once I got the decals on, did my wash, the normal wash of raw umber and lighter fluid. I found it works better. The lighter fluid instead of using um, mineral spirits or turpentine, but I did use a mineral spirits to wipe off any excess. The reason why I learned the, that trick of lighter fluid and oil paints from a, a fellow modeler uh, at the old hop shop I used to go to in Colonia, and it, I'm glad I followed it because it works and it works beautifully. As you can tell here, it's very, it's you can see the lines, but it's not as dirty. And I was trying for more of a just a been around the block a few times, not a beaten, dented, battered bird. And it worked very, very beautiful. Once I got everything done, put my flat coat on, problem solved, everything else went with it without a hitch. I did have some issues. One of them was my own doing. Like I said, I've mentioned a couple times, I'm very ham-handed. You, you might be able to see it. You notice the, um, the lock, the pins on the, on the bulge keel that attach to the fuel tank, they're missing. That's because I'm very clumsy, <laughs> I'm very ham-handed, so, and as far as I'm concerned, nobody's going to notice it unless they flip it over, and I'm not taking it to a contest, so I left them alone as is. So I did that, put the fuel tank on, because I felt the P47 looked naked without anything, and like you said, earlier block P47s were modified in the field with the bulge keel, so this way I just gave it a fuel tank to give it extended range. Guns are still on, of course. And once everything's then done, did the final assembly, did all my, did everything, voila, the kit came out really nice. That was actually the last build I did before vacation, or I actually was working on a project, but we'll talk about that in the next video. And it came out really, really good. It came out beautiful. So I'm really happy with the results. Um, as I mentioned about the super scale, the stars and bars from the super scale weren't the only ones I had issues with. I don't know if they were using a different printer, it was where they did a different approach with their decals. It wasn't just the stars and bars, it was also the red. So the only stenciling I really took from the <clears throat> Tamiya decals was these here, as you can see. And I think the red spots were supposed to be, I'm not sure. Regardless of which, taken care of. I did have a pain in the ass time masking the canopy. I had some trouble with it for some odd reason. I'm pretty good at masking canopies, but I ended up doing the old tried and true method of <clears throat> of painting everything by hand. Now, I'm up there in age, and my trade, unfortunately, is wearing down my eyes. So I had to get the glasses out. And eventually, you're going to see glasses on my face on a full-time basis, or at least for reading. But back to, <laughs> back to the canopy. I did my usual. I did the future. You know, I dipped in a future floor finish. I gave it a... Yeah, I covered it full day. It was just... I just had troubles. That's all it was. Otherwise, it wasn't any problems. At least, uh, a few of it was my own doing. Um, any other troubles? <clears throat> Had a little bit of trouble with the flaps, but since I was buttoning it up and it gave me the option of the flaps up or down, I had to do a lot of, I did some dry fitting for my sake and it came out better than I thought. Um, decals, I already mentioned about that. If you pick up like later issue super scale decals, be wary of them. You might have some trouble like I did. They do conform well. They're a little more br brittle and fragile than they used to be. So, you know, just be careful. 
with the with super scale decals. You might find some old sheets of the super scale decals. You do take advantage of them and run. <laughs> <clears throat> Otherwise, this kit basically it just fell right together. Everything fit beautifully, no troubles, and if you do your research right, it's just a wonderful, wonderful kit. It really is. Um, is it better than a Hasegawa kit? I haven't built a Hasegawa kit, so I can't say, but I can definitely tell you that it's Tamaya. It's a beautiful kit. It's just wonderful. Tamaya also makes a bubble top P47, and they make a P47M. Now, I'm hoping they'll make a P47N, which is this specifically for the Pacific Theater. And I'm hoping they'll do that. And I would recommend this for beginners or veterans or experts. Now, how I acquired the kit, I probably talked about it before. It's been about a year. I lost an old friend. I should consider a friend on the internet. I traded him the P47 kit for the P47. I traded him a Phantom kit. From Hasegawa and he was looking for something specific. I was looking for something specific. We both had the kits at the time. Result, it worked out. He never got the chance to finish it unfortunately and I miss him now. He he was fun to talk to. He's, he was part of a modeling group but we're all part of and he moved on last year yeah, and we all miss him. The group, everybody misses him because he was kind of like a wise sage to us. <laughs> you know, he was only a couple of years, maybe two or three years older than me. But he was fun to talk to, and he had quite a bit of knowledge. Like, it ended up being just a side project build to an honor build for him, and that's what I did ever since then. Now i just got to find a bookshelf for it. We talked about that in the last video where I had to pick up bookshelves. Hopefully the yard sales will be kicking in around my neighborhood, so I'll be getting them soon. But otherwise, that's for the kit. Back to the P47. The options are really good. Now, the, the Tamaya kit comes with loaded with options. Like, it comes with rockets, bombs, fuel tanks. I think it's got, like, two, three different kind of types of, of fuel tanks. If you're not happy with those, you can always get aftermarket. It comes with several different type of propellers. This one is the Curtis one. I think this is the thinner blade, since it's the early P-47. But they do have the bigger blade. They have the Hamilton Standard. I think there was one more out there the P-47 used. Cuffed, uncuffed. I think they got them all. If I remember correctly, it's my kit. Um, of course, like I said, builds up to a block 25. You just pick and choose the options accordingly. If you want to use a photo etch, you can. I wouldn't. Uh, at most, maybe you need um, a cockpit set. Maybe. Otherwise, or you just get in it, or you just use photo etch seatbelt set, which would help it lately if you're going to display the cockpit open. Otherwise, it's a beautiful kit from beginning to end. It's just great. It's wonderful. Although I do recommend getting a um, aftermarket decal sheet if you're not building what's in there. You have Little Chief, which I think is done to death. <clears throat> Sorry, guys. It's just, you know, that's even though it's got the Indian head, it's really cool. I just think it's been done to death. There's Spirit of Atlantic City, which is actually kind of a different subject. But there's plenty of other subjects of the P47, of the Razorback version. There's... Pacific Theater, of course, there's natural metal, um, of course, olive drab over neutral gray. Or you could do the early uh, early P-47s, like Gabby Gabreski or something. So if you want to do that, you can. You just got to know where to look for the decal sheets. Otherwise, this is it. This is the best kit ever, and I really highly recommend it if you find it. You can still find it. It's Tamaya. Need I say more? But I really, really recommend this kit. <clears throat> if you find the Hasegawa, try that. Anybody who's built it before, let me know. So this way I know what, if I ever built it, build it, I know what I'm up against. So, even though I'm not still not building, I'll still be sharing. I'll be talking about past builds. And this is all I have for now. If you have any questions about, if I can remember correctly on the P40 set on this kit, if you have any other questions, let me know. Um, happy modeling. Take it easy, guys. And hopefully... I will talk to you guys again soon. Have fun.